myself to see where that girl is, um, give her a Coke and I invite her around to my house. Um, think big, or as I like to put it, uh, go big or go home. That's what we're all here for. So I'm just going to start with a little bit about the background of what I think about Think Big. My husband asked me what I was up to tonight on the rare occasions where we actually have a proper conversation that doesn't start with, you know, did British gas come or <laughs> did the dishwasher guy fix what he was supposed to fix or has everyone done their homework? Uh, I replied that it was an evening about empowering women. So he was very supportive and rolled his eyes and uh, exclaimed, how much more empowerment do you need, for heaven's sake? Now, I'm inserting the more polite version. His was a little more earthy. So once I had him a headlock, I said, uh, I did pause to think about what he'd said. And I'm a fair person, and I realized that, in part, he was absolutely right. I'm standing before you a product of the finest schools and universities in the world, with a raft of blue chip companies littered all over my CV. Yes, I have a good brain, and I have worked very hard, but I have been empowered every step of the way. My parents, my friends, mentors, colleagues, even my husband, have always pushed away and fed my ambition by telling me that nothing is impossible and nothing is unachievable. If I'm prepared to want it enough and work as hard as I can towards it. So by and large, every woman in this room is already empowered to a certain extent. Well, why else would you be here? So we all know how wonderful that feels where you have those moments where you are in charge of your own destiny. So tonight, I would like us to think about those of us who may never know what you have felt or are feeling when you feel that shudder of empowerment or when you've, when you've nailed something amazing, whether it's in your work or in your personal life. I'm not going to bombard you with statistics, but we all know what is happening in our part of the world. Last month, I was lucky enough to be invited to a screening of a documentary called Girl Rising about the importance of education uh, in the developing world and how it lowers female mortality, increases GDP, and creates opportunity for countries to work their way out of poverty. We all owe it to ourselves and the chances that we have been given to be grateful for our own empowerment and use it to help another woman who may not have felt what we have felt and enjoyed the opportunities that we have. So my own journey begins, like Gorinda, in Southall. Uh, that's always a big surprise to a lot of people. Uh, my greatest fortune in life is to be born to my, a child to my own parents, Atta and Toto Rafiq. My father was a young lawyer, setting up his practice. Uh, he had a very controlling, scary father who was a loving and divine grandfather to all of us. But as a parent, he must have been really scary. Anyhow, he had a row with his dad and his dad said, well, you can leave. So he had a wife who was expecting a little baby, me, and he decided to set out on his own set up his own law practice, and that's how they started. Um, they're both incredibly progressive when it comes to childcare. I was either sitting in a playpen in my father's office or with my mum, while he doled out legal advice to all his clients. Within two years of my birth, my father's hard work and success had brought us a new life in leafy Surrey. But my work ethic was instilled at an early age by those their very same parents, and I think I've worked on and off pretty much since I was 16 years old, whether it's school vacations, gap year, throughout university, before landing my first real job at Pricewaterhouse after graduation. I have always admired other people's drive and ambition. Don't forget, grew up in the 80s, Joan Collins, Dynasty, thought this is what I was gonna do when I left school. I was gonna put some big shoulder pads on, big earrings, you know, still got a bit of the earrings, still got the bling. And I was going to rule the world, and nobody was ever going to tell me no. Because I too grew up with a conservative Pakistani family who were very big on, don't do that, sit properly. Is that, if you, is that how you sit in public? Sit properly, stand right. Why, why help, help, go in the amount of strangers' houses which I was encouraged to make tea in. <laughs> I didn't know where their kitchens were. And my mother would say, they would say, 
better have some tea. And my mother would say, Alia will make it. Yeah. And I would say, I don't know where the kitchen is, mom. <laughs> she says, you'll make it. Go find the kitchen. Find it. So we've all been there, right? So we all know what that's like. So there have been obstacles. I'm not going to lie. No one will ever tell you it's an easy ride to the top, however effortless they make it look. A famous author that I watched on TV was once asked why he had waited till his 40s, very young, to publish his first piece of fiction. He replied his father had told him that the second most important thing in life was to do something that you loved. Confused, the interviewer said, but then what's the most important thing? The author smiled and said succinctly, pay the rent. <laughs> now, in my professional life, I have loved my career and the work that I've done, and it has been overwhelmingly glamorous and extremely privileged. But sometimes it has been a job. And like millions, I have had times in my career where you just put your head down and get through the day. Yes, I am driven, determined, sometimes selfishly single-minded about my career. But I'm also realistic about the level of commitment that one can give at any one time without dropping one of the delicate glass balls that any one of us women ever seems to have in the air at any one time. I started life in, at Pricewaterhouse fresh out of university, and while I loved the audit process, I will tell you very honestly, I sucked at bookkeeping, which is not a good thing if you're training to be an accountant. And for the first time, I found myself closer to the bottom of the class than instead of the top, where I arrogantly assumed where I should just like set up residence anyway. So it taught me an important lesson that we only like to do the things that we are good at, but it is better for you to battle with the things that you aren't naturally gifted at or suck at, as that was the case with me. I think it teaches you humility and real respect for anyone who has a skill that you do not possess. So you fast forward to life now, I'm running a company. I have no problem admitting when I don't know the answer to something or when I cannot do something. Moreover, I now see that problems are just solutions waiting to be found. So when my own nine-year-old is wrestling with her increasingly challenging homework, what is it with homework? That she's nine, I am a lot older than nine, but it's like another language. And if you try and give your, you know, I'm like, girlfriend, I run a million pound company. And she's just like, you don't write anything on it. Don't say this, don't speak to my teachers. I'm like the uncool, uncoolest mother ever. So anyhow, I do try and make her break down the problem and say, try and solve it yourself because mom is obviously no help whatsoever. So when we see problems, the first thing that we'd feel is fear. So ask yourself this one question when faced with any obstacle. What would I do if I wasn't afraid? The answer may seem ridiculous at first, but it will soon lead you to a solution. You would never have got to if you hadn't been paralyzed by, oh Christ, now what, you know. My next chapter was working for publishing giant Conan Ast. I, I would never have assumed as a young British Pakistani girl that this is the kind of place where I should work. It was populated by lots of very pretty blonde girls, all called Fiona and Caroline, and all had lovely, lovely, lovely jobs, and you know, lovely, lovely, lovely families, and you know, that kind of thing. Um, but I had worshipped Vogue and its sister title since I was old enough to read, so it was actually very simple in the end. I wrote a letter, put my CV on it, put it in the post, got invited for an interview and was offered a job immediately to work with the chairman of Conde Nast International. So sometimes we psych ourselves out of even trying because we think we don't have a chance. Many times, when my mother, funnily enough, was the one who said, why don't you try for Vogue? And I was like, get real. You know, like, who's going to give me a job there? She's like, oh, don't, don't try, don't, mm, whatever. In the only way that an Asian mother can say, mm. oh, don't try, then, go, then cry about it later. <laughs> anyway, so there is no mystery to employment. Companies need people to do jobs. I mean, it's very simple in that way. And they, you just need to find out what it is they're looking for and apply for it. I've turned down applicants only to call them back six months later and hire them because the person I hired was a dud. You know, it's the, another lesson there is, you know, there's no harm admitting when you're wrong. You know, as long as you have a solution to the problem and the mess that you've made, what I do find personally exasperating though is when a staff member makes a mistake, which then they don't tell you about, and it sort of causes this tsunami of, of other problems and then stand behind, beside you in front of you going, 
So this is the big mess that I've made. Can you take it? Well, yeah, that does not make me a happy person at all. You know, my thing is, I don't care about blame. Fix it, fix it, find a solution. That is what you should be doing. So big deal, everyone makes mistakes. Find a solution, fix the problem, move on. That's the way I was raised and that's how I want people who work with me to think when they approach things. So during my time at Conde Nast, as we said, we went, I was sent to Russia for two years, not because I was bad for work. Um, this was an incredible experience and probably the most educational time of my life. You can keep your MBAs because no amount of role play and no amount of case study can prepare you for a face-to-face -face meeting with a Chechen Mafia Don who has a fur coat company as a business, which is basically a fund for his um, less attractive activities. Anyway, negotiating that meeting in Russian while his two thugs kept their hands on their gun bulges was pretty intense, but in the way of the young and inexperienced, I just don't remember being scared. Just that this is going to be an amazing story when I get back to London. <laughs> By the end of the meeting, we were fast friends, as his name was Rafik Anvarovich and my name was Alia Rafik. And um, he sent me a fur coat the next day as a thank you and so nice to meet you, I sent it back in case my mother's watching. Um, she'd ask where the coat was. Anyhow, and he still sends me Christmas cards, so not a bad thing. Another point, never forget anyone who has been good to you. I have a list, I have another list for the other lot, you know. I keep every business card that I'm given and religiously follow up with people that I meet through work or socially or whatever it is. Sometimes you don't get feedback, but other times, miraculously and wonderfully, you make an amazing friend. I don't like to think of this as networking because I sometimes think that has slightly pejorative overturns, especially when it's women and networking, you know. But I think of it as connecting, and I think it's a big part of business and development, whether it's personal or for your, your own self, anyhow. When I returned to London, I was made managing editor of Tala. Now, for a lot of people, this is pretty remarkable because it's the oldest and most English magazine, and they decided to put a Pakistani woman at its financial and operational helm. <laughs> Stupid, but anyway. It, but, it was simple, and I made sure... Yeah, I was made sure I was the best person for the job and made that job my own. I was very blessed because I had an editor who literally went, here's the job, get on with it. And I think that taught me as a boss now, please don't micromanage your teams. It is the most... If you're working for somebody who does that, it is the most soul-destroying thing. And if you are that person, you will just... It's a one-way ticket to insanity. You hire the best people, set them their objectives clearly, and then let them get on with it. Help them when they need help, but don't hover over them. You know, helicopter mothers, helicopter bosses, neither of them are a good thing. Um, otherwise, you just reduce them to this sort of jelly of indecisiveness, and this great person that you hired to do the job becomes useless, and you end up sacking them six months later, not realizing that actually the problem is you, not them. So my years at Tatler were some of the happiest times in my professional career. It was an incredible place to work the caliber of people that I met, and some of the most jaw-dropping events I've ever attended. And it was also my home during the years when I met and married my husband and had both of my daughters. And as such, I'm very appreciative of the environment that I was lucky to be in at that time. I can't emphasize when you are a woman and working and having your children and being juggling everything, how important it is to have a supportive company behind you because if you don't, it, it literally will destroy, the, will make the difference between you continuing with your career, leaning into your career and embracing it, or becoming completely disillusioned with it and walking away. So, I mean, I took 10 months off with each baby, went back each time, and the decision was actually made for me by my employer and that they told me, you're having a year off and we don't expect to see you back for 12 months. I went back after 10 because I kind of got a little antsy at home, but you know. Um, I know this is not the case for everybody. And this is my word to anybody who knows anyone in government. If you want women to leave their precious babies at home and go to work and earn money to contribute to your tax revenues and your GDP, you need to let them buy the best childcare that they can afford. And the only way that you are going to do this is by letting women pay for their childcare out of their gross incomes. It is never going to change our
and it is something that literally drives me mental. I think that it is the thing that stops so many women from going back to work. How many girls that I have spoken to, young ones who are coming through Tatler, coming out of Koninas, who said to me, I want to go back to work, I cannot afford to go back because my salary and my childcare cancel each other out. So I'm literally going to be working for free. And I will tell you, the first year I went back after my daughter, that was probably the case. I think I've only made £100 a month. However, it is that thing of committing and leaning in, for want of a better phrase, that allows you, once you have done that, probably for after one year, and then suddenly you will see the career level jumps. Because you've shown your employer, and I can say this as an employer now, you've shown them that the commitment that you have for the company is there. That yes, you are a mother, you have taken that time out, but you are coming back full speed ahead, fully in, integrated and thinking about the company. Because at the end of the day, employers want people who want the best for the company as well as for themselves. So I do believe that we women have to use our voices to demand the best environments for us to work in. Remember, if you don't ask, you won't get. And in an age where C women at C-suite level, I'm talking COO, CEO level, are still earning 25% less than their male counterparts, it's time we made ourselves heard. So four years ago, my last chapter, if you like, before now, is I was headhunted to join Tatanaka. It's a small firm, small British luxury band, and I went from representing a really big brand with a big, big, big profile and a name that everybody knew to working for something that was, you'd say, I'm calling from Tatanaka, and they'd say, are you calling from Japan? Yeah. I'd be like, no, it's London. Uh, have you not heard of us? We're really famous. <laughs> Anyhow, in fashion speak, to come back after you've already launched and been around is, you know, very difficult. However, I think it has been the best experience for me anyway. And it is full on, it's manic, and most days I don't know what my name is. However, I wouldn't have it any other way. So it's been an honor and privilege to be part of the lineup here today. And I thank you all for your attention and hope you've enjoyed it as much as I've enjoyed being here.